listening to Big World Network. Just Kill Me, Season 5, Episode 6, My Moment. Written and read by Wendy Herman. What the hell were you thinking, Trevor? Why did you activate me? It was a stupid thing to do, I know. I just... I wanted to see you in action one more time. You were so incredible back then, Freya. I wish you could remember. Angelina Jolie doesn't even come close. You were... I could have been caught or killed, I interrupted dryly. Nah, we were watching you the whole time. And just think how satisfying it would have been to kill Dunwaddle with your own two hands. I wanted to give you that before I left. We? I asked, ignoring the part about Trevor assuming I was hunky-dory with being a cold-blooded killer. I'm so sorry, Frey. I promise I won't use my power for evil ever again. Scout's honor, he pleaded, trying to avoid my question. I imagined him holding two fingers up, making the scout promise. Pixley, I stated. If it's any consolation, he thought it was a bad idea, too. Well, then I might let him live. You are a wise and generous queen. So you don't take orders from anyone now? I accused. I said he thought it was a bad idea, not that he told me not to do it. Sigh. Was I the only one not seeing the appeal of my own personal Mr. Hyde? Trevor, I have a very busy kingdom to run. I said, hinting that I wanted to end our conversation. I know. We were both quiet for a moment. It was harder than I imagined it would be. He found the words before I could. Goodbye, Freya. I hesitated. Goodbye, Trevor. I'd said those words millions of times over the past two decades, but this time it really was goodbye. The next day, the news reported that Senator Dunwaddle had mysteriously vanished without a trace. Only the tabloids ran outlandish stories of alien abduction, moving in with Elvis, and entering a cryogenic stasis at an undisclosed experimental site in Canada. I was starting to realize that if the truth was too crazy to believe, the rags almost always had it right. Whether or not the cryogenic pod he'd paid a fortune for had been successful was anybody's guess. Maybe our grandchildren would have to contend with him in the distant future, but I was certain they would be able to handle it. In the here and now, we couldn't care less. I chose to believe he was dead, though I was glad it had not been by my hand, and slept like a baby every night. And just like that, it was over. It never ceases to amaze me how one moment in time, one split-second decision or inevitable occurrence can alter the course of your entire life. Ainsley's moment had been when she decided to take on the challenge Trevor had given her of removing our implants. He had pulled her out of her comfort zone and shown her that although technology is everywhere, people still control the world, and that the oldest, cheesiest saying is eternally true. Love conquers all. She and Leon decided to move to Wyoming, where she started her own software company. She focuses on educational programs for kids. They also started a self-sustaining farm where they live, and Leon homeschools their six brilliant children. All of them inherited Leon's strange resistance to the adverse effects of alcohol and drugs. It's essentially a commune for superheroes. We visit them as often as we can. Leon's moment, of course, was when he took my advice, mustered up his courage, and asked Ainsley out. And yes, I plan to take credit for that forever. Talia's moment had been when she made her family and friends her top priority over her job. The 24 never contacted her again, at least not that she mentioned, and six months later she gave birth to beautiful little Freya Magdalene, nicknamed Lilu. She and Lars still live next door. Together they opened a firing range just outside of town. I teach a beginner's class for them called Mama's Packin' for bored housewives. Lars is an open book. He told me once that his moment was the first time he laid eyes on Talia, and I believe him. Seriously, I'm not stupid enough to accuse Arnold Schwarzenegger of lying. Jerry's moment came to him when Ty and I nearly killed him on that dark road. He missed his family and discovered that a lot can be forgiven when you're willing to change. He became the second most influential man in my children's lives, and even got back in touch with his own son, my brother Locke. 
he then decided to play catch-up on the psychology of the 21st century and went back to school. He eventually got a license to practice, something he'd never actually done before, and volunteered his professional counseling services at the local community center, where he could atone somewhat for checking out of society for 20 years. He moved into Ty's old apartment and has dinner with us almost every night. Jerry can afford to work for free, because three days before he was to sign the closing paperwork to sell his land in Garrity, an oil reserve was discovered below his fallout shelter. A year later he paid for a fairy tale wedding for Locke and his lovely fiancée in Rome, and flew the whole family to Europe to be there. I eventually asked him about the picture I'd taken from his house, of him as a small boy and his Aunt Lizzie. He smiled and told me she had been a very influential woman in his life. She had also been one of the first female spies for the American government. She was a trained killer, just like me. And her resemblance to the world-famous movie star hadn't hurt one bit, either. I didn't tell him I'd met her, over thirty years after her death, for fear he would want to analyze me. I didn't need anyone else to know. Maybe I would tell Ty one day, but for now she and I had our secret, and I liked it that way. I knew she was watching over me, and it made me feel safe. Well, safer. Trevor's moment came, in my opinion, after my first flashback, which he claims was three years before the profound one I experienced with Ty near that deserted bridge. It was the moment he knew I could never really be his. Trevor eagerly took a transfer to the FBI contingent in Moscow, where he may or may not have grown up as a Russian-born lad. I may never know the truth about the enigma that is my ex-husband, and I don't care to. He sends the boys birthday and Christmas presents every year, but rarely visits. The boys miss him, but have several ways in this techno age to stay in touch with him, and they all do. They eventually took to calling him Uncle Trevor. And I'm not allowed to answer the phone if the caller ID says Trevor or unknown, just in case. Ty claims his moment was actually a series of moments, occurring here and there over the last twenty years. Any time he felt a pang of nervousness when he caught my eyes, or brushed against me accidentally. He couldn't recall the very first time it happened, but he said it gave him hope. He just didn't know for what at the time. He decided to retire from the FBI and write a series of books, fiction, of course, based on our life. It's an action-adventure series, each story featuring a heroine named Isis. He's home a lot thanks to his new farm career, and the boys call him Dad because that's who he is. It seemed like an eternity, but when I really thought about it, it had only been about four months since the day I decided to become an FBI agent. Again. One day I was June Cleaver raising the beeve and his brothers, and thinking my marriage was made in heaven. And the next, I was finding out the books on my bookshelf were all blank, because I lived in a dream world. Even my relationship with Ty, the program plutonic haziness, had been all wrong. The only reality, the only constant, was my boys. As the information from the implant fully integrated into my brain, some of the enhanced reflexes and skills we'd been programmed with came back to me. Although Ty claimed he didn't have the same experience, I knew better. He just wasn't interested in being a killing machine anymore. He lovingly refers to me as his bionic wife, and the sex blows Edward and Bella, post becoming a vampire, right out of the water. My moment had been the wake-up call to beat all wake-up calls, so jarring because I had been asleep a long time. Thanks to my son's vivid imagination that a quarter was chewing gum, an act that had nearly cost him his life, the veil keeping me in my foggy dream world had been shattered. I realized now that being an FBI agent really was what I wanted, so much so that I turned down a promotion to assistant regional director to stay in the field a little while longer. I eventually took the position, but not until I'd had my fill of adventure, yanking Ty out of retirement every now and then when my undercover work required a love interest. I know my boys worried about me whenever work took me away from home, but mostly they just thought it was pretty cool to have a spy mom. Ty blamed his ever-graying hair on his constant concern for my safety, but he never made me think I had to quit just to ease his mind. Plus, his gray hair is sexy. The journey toward becoming whole again had been violently thrust upon me, and I grabbed hold with both hands. I was scared, but the thought of ever being that numb, fembot housewife again 
was terrifying. Resistance was indeed futile, and I'd discovered that once, long ago, I'd been wide awake. Somehow, during my years with Trevor, I'd forgotten how it felt to be truly happy, or truly sad. Everything had been muted. Color, sound, emotion. I couldn't blame Ty or Trevor, or my dad. I couldn't even blame the government implant. Not really. It had been my decision from the beginning. I had no one to blame but myself. And that realization freed me. Whatever I got myself into, implant or no implant, I was fully capable of getting myself out of. I owned it. Every mistake I'd ever made. Every wrong turn I'd ever taken. And all the mistakes and wrong turns waiting for me. It was all mine. And I could finally start living. Listening to Big World Network.